Revelation, Revelation chapter 1. Uh, while you're turning there, I encourage you to remember our missionaries. Uh, as far as I know, all is well. And I'm praying the Lord will keep it that way. Revelation chapter 1. And we're going to begin reading in verse 9. Revelation chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 9, the Bible says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of the Lord and for the testimony of of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto, so uh, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake, uh, that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the uh, seven candlesticks were one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about with paps, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head were as hairs were white like snow, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if, it, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and two of them, and two, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in strength. And when I saw him, I fell on his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me and said unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for another opportunity to be in your house, Lord, for, a, for the privilege to look again on your word. God, we pray that you would use this word to touch the hearts of the believers and, Lord, to convict the lost, Lord, that you might be defined, that you might, they might see you as the only answer to sin. God, we pray that you might meet with us this morning and we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory. And the honor for it all, for it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture, uh, but what we'll be preaching on is how you see Christ. And what I have found is people see Christ in many different ways, and in some truth, He has many different roles that He does fulfill, but it's all important that we see Christ for who he is. Now, we live in a day and age where people see Christ in a multitude of different ways that is wrong. Uh, first and foremost, Christ is not on the cross. Uh, that work is done, and that victory is done, and he's somewhere else now. Uh, Christ is not in a manger. Uh, that's a Catholic fable. That work happened but that work is done. And, and so what is Christ to you? How do you see him? How do you perceive Christ? Uh, today in the modern day, most don't perceive Christ as he is. Uh, most really don't even know where he is. The Bible says that he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Uh, that's why we need the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost is because he's not here. Uh, remember what the angel said when... Uh, when uh, Mary went to the tomb. They said, Behold, he's not here. And it's the same situation today. Christ is not here. He is at the right hand of the Father. 
And, and, and so we, as the Lord's people, it's critical that we truly know how Christ ought to be perceived. And so with that thought, we're, we're going to go on with this. And it begins, I, John. Now, uh, some literature, and you know, you take that for what it is, uh, some literature suggests that by this point, uh, John was quite elderly when he was rejected and placed on the Isle of Patmos. Uh, John was the only apostle to live to be old. Some suggest he was past 100 uh, when he died. And uh, he, he lived to see Paul's ministry. Uh, uh, he uh, knew the Lord intently. Uh, he was the one that laid his young head on the breast of Jesus and said, Lord, is it I? Uh, he didn't trust himself. He was, some say that he was just a 15-year-old boy when he was called to be an apostle. So he, he spent a very long life serving the Lord. Uh, what could be better? What more could be said of, uh, of the Apostle John? And so he says, I, John, who also am your brother. Notice it does not say I am your Pope. He says, I'm your brother. I, I, I'm your I, I'm your fellow. We're we're on the same plane. We're on uh, we're on the same ground. Uh, uh, didn't take any merit for himself. I, John, who also am your brother, and then he begins the part of being a companion. Now, a companion is someone that goes with you places, that stays with you, that you experience the same thing. That is a companion. Now, we're going to find that despite what is occurring here, that uh, John was kind of having a rough road of it. He was about to see Jesus in the flesh for uh, one of the two that saw Jesus in the flesh after the resurrection. Him and Paul exclusively got to see that. And I want you to see that as, as he is here, that... He addresses the church as his companions. So a companion, me and Donna have been companions for 35 years, and what she's experienced, I've experienced, and what I've experienced, she's experienced. So remember, as we're looking down these lists of events, if you're a solid believer in Christ, at the very least, you're at risk for these events. Uh, you, you, the likelihood, the possibility of you experiencing these things is very real. And so he says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. <laughs> now, have you ever wondered, I think there's two full reasons why we don't experience more tribulation now. Now, uh, buckle your seatbelt because it's probably coming. Uh, but I want you to see, I think there's two reasons. The first and foremost, at least till recently, we've been protected by the Constitution that we can, we can worship as we wish. But I think that will soon come to an end. Right. And the other thing, we don't stand strong enough to be tribulated. You see what I'm saying? Uh, you ever been made fun of? Only time I've been made fun of for my testimony was when I was street preaching. People didn't want to hear it. Uh, you ever had that experience? Most of us have not. And the reason why is because we're not more outspoken. We're, we're not more uh, trenched in. And, and so as John begins to write, he says, you're my companion, you're my fellow helper, you're, we walk together. And the first thing he says we walk together in is tribulation. Love the second one. And in the kingdom. Isn't it a blessed thing that we are in the kingdom? Now, I don't know about you, but I personally believe the kingdom of Christ and the church of Christ are two different things. 
I, I believe uh, the bride of Christ is yet a third thing. I don't believe there. Are, I don't believe any of them are synonymous or speaking of the same thing. I think they're all different. But I believe all the redeemed, all the saved, the Baptists, if they're saved in a separate group. I believe that is the kingdom of Christ. I do not believe. You know what? This this crazy new uh, reformed church movement that's, I mean, eating up our young people, you know what they believe? They believe all the redeemed make up the church. That That's a scary, you, you know what other group teaches that? Catholics. Pretty scary, isn't it? Uh, it makes me fearful for my children. And, and so I want you to see as John is writing this that he uh, says you're going to be my companion, uh, my fellow person in tribulation, but blessed be the name of the Lord. We're in the kingdom. We're saved. We've been born again. You're my fellow in that as well. And patience of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know this morning if you're his fellow, if you're his companion in patience or not. Uh, I am not a patient man, and at least I admit it. Most people, you know what will teach you patience? Age. <coughs> Poor health. That will teach you patience. And it, it, it's a shame that it has to take events like that to teach his patience, but that's what I have found is that uh, young people are probably the most impatient people there are, and it's simply because they're young. <laughs> when you're young, you can get up and do what you want, and there's no patience involved in that, right? And, and so the, the next thing he says, you are my fellow, you are my, you, you are my companion <coughs> in patience. Now, why was he needing patience? He was on the Isle of Patmos. You know what the Isle of Patmos was for? It's for people to starve to death on. The Romans used it. You were arrested. You were taken out by boat. Farther than most people, all people could swim, especially if you were as old as John was at this point. You were placed there, essentially a rock, not a true island. And unless, unless somebody had compassion and brought you something to eat, you were starved to death. That, that's the Isle of Patmos. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't Gilligan's Island. It wasn't a, a lush place to live. It was a rock. And, and so you know what that brought in John's life, no doubt? Patience. Patience. It probably taught him that, that waiting was a necessity and that even in that, even in that empty stomach waiting, Therein was Christ. And so he says, are you my fellow? Are you my, uh, are you my companion in this? In the patience of Jesus Christ. Also, patience in Jesus Christ is patiently waiting for his returning. Now this is the thing. And sometimes I have, you know, even, even so come Lord Jesus. But you know what I really need to do is be patient. It's on <laughs> his agenda, not mine. And so be patient in his coming. Do what he said to do while we're waiting. Spread the gospel. Uh, tell the good news. The, the death and burial and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Continue to do that while we're waiting. While we're waiting. And so they, he, the, they were supposed to be his companion in this. His companion in doing these things. And then uh, I was on the Isle of Patmos uh, for the word of God. Again, you can answer for yourself if you would be arrested for that. And for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So he's, he's out there on that rock. And notice in verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now, I want you to see, uh, and if you underline in your Bible, underline this, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. That is distinctively different than the Sabbath. The Sabbath belongs to the Jew. What, when is the Sabbath? It's Saturday. And uh, what is the Sabbath? It's the end day of the week. But what are we supposed to give unto the, to the Lord Jesus Christ? 
our first fruits, right? right? We're to tithe off the top. If you make uh, if you make a hundred dollars a week and take home eighty, the tithe is not eight dollars; it's ten dollars, right? And you, you give him the first of everything. So Christ deserves our first day. He gets what's off the top, right? And, and another danger of the modern day, this has occurred in my life, is the Messianic Jew movement. Being redeemed don't make you, don't make you a Jew. Being redeemed makes you a Christian. Right. And, and, and so we see that... Uh, as John is writing, he, he makes it very clear that the Lord's Day is Sunday. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day and heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega. Now, uh, uh, Mama grew up with some girls. Uh, uh, the older one was the same age as Patsy and the younger one was the same age as Mama. Alfie and, uh, Alfie and Omega. Uh, they that you know bless their hearts only in Carlisle right uh, and they they but what that really is is Alpha and Omega is what in the English uh, language would be I'm 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 A from to Z <laughs> I am everything that is Greek letters in their alphabet and it, it, it corresponds with the first and the last I'm everything in between if you can think of it that's who I am I'm Alpha and Omega and you know what that'd be just like me slipping up behind y'all and say hey I'm Larry because he knew who he was John, John spent all that time with him and he says I, you, you know who I am, John. You, you know, you, uh, we spent that three and a half years together, and, and you certainly know who I am and, and, and what I'm about. I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. He emphasizes that again. <laughs> and what thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches. Now, uh, I'll say this, and a lot of people don't like this. This revelation... Is for the church. It, it, it's not a general epistle. He said, send this to the church. Now, way over here in Genesis, you know what? That's for everybody. This is for the church. He said, send to the churches, and then he gives, uh, he gives seven churches that specifically need this, and unlike the Ephesian letter, although Ephesus is named here, and like the Corinthian letter, uh, they're short, sweet, and to the point, but they're still churches. Now, uh, I take four or five medicines a day. Do you want to take them? Do you want to take Donna's medicine? Do you want to take Brother Junior's medicine? <laughs> you know what? If I did that, if I took some of my medicine, uh, I take five pills in the morning and give it to everybody in the building, give one set to each person, some it would do nothing to. It'd be like taking a glass of water. Some, it might help. And some, it could potentially kill. You see what I'm saying? Not everybody needs the same dose. Not everybody needs the same medicine. So he sent each church a different letter specific to their needs and to the church at Philadelphia just to brag on them and say, hey, keep it up, you're doing well. And uh, that was, so he identified his, himself in that way. And I turned to see, verse 12, the voice that spake with me and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now, throughout this uh, section of the revelation to the churches, we will, we will hear about these golden candlesticks again. Uh, uh, because to each one of them, except from Philadelphia, he says, huh, get things straight, or I'm going to take your candle. Right? And that, that's what they were. Each one had one. And again, the, the obsession with the Messianic Jew these days, uh, there was a, a candlestick 
in the temple, and it did have seven, uh, seven candles on it, but it has nothing to do with this. Where, where they came up with that, I have no idea. Because he literally tells each one, I'm going to take your candlestick, seven candles, seven churches. It don't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. I went to W.T. Thomas, and it makes sense to me. Right? And, and, and so we see that uh, if we're not very careful, we think everything applies to everyone. And it does. Now, all the Bible applies to each of us, but we need different things at different times in our life. Verse 12, And I turned to see, that the, turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst, or the middle of the seven candlesticks, one and two like unto the Son of Man. Now, uh, capital S, uh, Son in your King James Bible, and, and why, why did he immediately recognize him? He spent a long time with him. Uh, and we're going to see he's not the long-haired Jesus that the Catholics print out. But um, he, he looks totally different than that. But I want you to see that he knew him. He said, oh, yeah, that's Jesus. I, I remember. And you know what? This could have been 60 years after the Lord offered the sacrifice. We just don't know. He was so much younger than Christ, and he lived so much longer than Christ, than Christ lived on the earth that we really don't know. But immediately, he recognized him and said, oh, yeah, I know exactly who that is. I understand specifically this is Jesus. And notice how he's clothed. One like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a white garment down to the foot. Now, I'm not going to get too deeply on that, but it don't take a rocket scientist to figure that out either. Uh, we don't need to go be running around showing ourselves. And that's not a popular teaching today, but it is what the Bible teaches. Clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the pipes with a golden girdle. Now, uh, the pipes is the upper part of the torso. If you remember uh, the priestly garment, uh, the girdle went here. And it had an ephod or a jewel right here. And, and now we find that in the, in the New Testament, the girdle goes across here, but it's still golden. Now, that, that represents two things. Number one, it represents authority because it's up here. You know, you know who has all authority? The Lord God Almighty and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. All authority belongs to them. And then I also want you to see his purity. Uh, who, what, what's going to happen in London here and I think it's next month. They're going to coronate uh, the king. His mommy died back in October or something. Yeah. And uh, they're going to have a, have a brand new king. And they're going to coordinate. And you know what's going to be on his head? A golden crown. It's for recognition. It, it, it's for recognizing the authority. Uh, no longer Prince Charles, but King Charles. And uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was no longer the suffering peasant. But now he's on his throne. And so we find that immediately uh, the Apostle John knows who he is and recognizes and sees his royalty. Notice it says in verse 14, his head and his hairs were white like wool. Now, a couple of things on that. First of all, I mean, um, maybe his hair was, was white. But white... Often, all, always, always, always represents purity. I, I believe it showed the pu purity for who he, for for who he was. You know, uh, Adam. Uh, uh, he, he loves this, and he'd be doing my hair. Dad, your hair is still getting sure getting gray. And I'm like, well, you sure put him up there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you know, almost in the modern day, that that's an embarrassment. <clears throat> But no, no. Uh, even in the flesh, the Bible says the hoary hairs have wisdom. 
meaning the gray-headed people have wisdom. The, the elders have wisdom. Listen to what they have to say. But I really believe here in, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's His purity. It's His sinlessness. It, it is Him without, without one piece of harm, one piece of sin in His life. It's, it's the full purity of Christ, and we find that John the Apostle recognized it. Listen, if there was one little sin in the person of Christ, we would be a people most miserable. We would be a people without hope. We would be a people that, that were bound for surely to go to hell, but I want you to see that that was not the case, that he was pure and white. Verse 14, the next characteristic, or at the end of verse 14, there was a flame, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And what does fire do besides burn? It hurts, right? Everybody, oh, you know, I have a cousin online. I won't even say who she is, but she, she doesn't like my, my, my doctrine because all she wants to hear is of the goodness of God. And that is a wonderful, rich, beautiful truth. But the, here, he's presented with eyes as fire. And fire does two things. It burns and it burns and it hurts. And then the other thing it does, it lights up a dark room. Right? You know what? You ain't got nothing here. We think we do, but we ain't got nothing here. These churches thought that they were looking good. They ought to say, they ought to see and say, we are rich and filled with goods. And he says, you stupid thing. You don't even know that you have nothing. But see, the Lord knew, did he not? He, it was all illuminated to him. And so as John is perceiving this, we see that uh, one thing we can find of Christ, nothing is hid from Christ. He's pure and holy and good. And he's in full authority. And so we see then the Christ of the Bible and the Christ of the world are two different things. Verse 15, his feet are like unto fine brass, again of his purity, and where he walks is holy, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Now, this is just, again, my opinion, but to show the power of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, what happened on the day of Pentecost that most people take out of context? They did speak in tongues. 17, if I understand it right. But see, the 17 that they spoke in are listed, and they were real languages. And is there a gift of tongues? You betcha. Did it die with the apostles? Probably every bit of it did. Now, I know people who are fluent in other languages. I think that's a gift. I mean, I, I can't even speak English well, much less take on a second group. So there is a gift of tongues, but I want you to see that the real... Um, have, you, have you read how that really is stated in, in the Bible? It said that every man was amazed that they heard heard in their own language. And, and so we see that uh, this, this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, how, how glory, glorious and wonderful speaking again so everyone could understand it. That is the person of Christ. Verse 16, And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shine, uh, as the sun shineth in the strength. Now I want you to again see two things. Number one, he had the seven candlesticks, and now he has seven arrows. Right? Uh, and what do you do with these? You shoot them. <laughs> Not real pleasant teaching. Yeah, this is the gist of that teaching. He's got his beat on you. 
Is he going to shoot you? Probably not. But listen, he knows, he knows you inside and out. He knows everything about you. And you know what? With that authority, could he take my life? You betcha. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3, 2, no, 3, uh, 4, uh, that uh, honor thy father and thy mother, that it may be well with thee, and that thy days may be long upon the earth. Meaning, I believe, if you treat mom and daddy right, that uh, he'll give you a good, strong life. And you know what? There's no qualifications on that. My dad was a deadbeat. Uh, you know, a lot of people, well, that's not very nice of the preacher say, I'm just telling you the truth. He was drunk. Lord saved him by his mercy and grace six weeks before he went out into eternity. But despite dad's issues, it was not an excuse not for me to honor him. Right? Uh, I, I would have been playing the same game he had if I was like, you know what? I don't care if you have cancer, deal with it. Right? And so we see then that we as the Lord's people have rich and wonderful blessings in the person of Christ, and he sees everything we do, so it should drive us to service, not away from it, but it should drive us to service. Now, the other thing that he had was... Uh, the two-edged sword. Now, what, what is significant about a two-edged sword? It cuts going and coming. Now, a lot of swords have one sharp side, and one side kind of you can protect yourself with. But a two-edged sword, this way and that way, it cuts going and coming. Now, the rich blessings of the Word of God are good and whole. <laughs> uh, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they shall and you, and you shall be saved. What richer blessing could that be? But you know, sometimes it cuts a little bit. You wicked and vile generation. I mean that kind of quick uh, cuts both ways, don't it? But it's but it's true. And you know what? This is what I have found. We need both. We need the good. And we need the ones that hurt a little bit along the way. And that, that is found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, we need to understand. Listen, it's not all health and wealth. You know what the Bible says concerning us? We are pilgrims and strangers. We don't belong here. And you know what? If we're fit in, you may have a problem. You may have a spiritual issue. We're, we're not to fit in. We are to be different. You know what? We ought to, uh, we ought to, stick, we ought to stick out like a man with two left feet. And so we find that he can correct us in that way. I love verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. You never have that much respect for Christ. I don't think I do. Maybe when I see him without this flesh to hinder me, maybe I will. Now remember, best I understand until this verse, all he does is, is see the Lord walking in and among the candlesticks. I think it was a vision. I think it's fixing to change from that. But I, was, I believe he was seeing, having an, an apostolic vision and he seen him in there moving about and knew who it was and just fell out. <laughs> Wonder why he fell out. I think the unbelievable thing that he was in, in the presence of Christ. Mm -hmm. But also he saw him die. He saw him resurrected and, and ascended back to the Father on the day of Pentecost. But he hadn't seen him since. <laughs> That makes a big difference, don't it? Don't, don't it? And it's taken a long time. And he fell down. He, 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 he was amazed. And he was in front of the holiness of Christ. Listen, uh, these people that run about and woo and all that stuff today, I wonder sometimes do they really understand who Christ is? 
Listen, he's holy. He's not your buddy. You know, of all the things I've heard concerning the person of, of the Almighty and concerning the uh, uh, presence of Christ, the person of Christ, one thing I cannot stand and I almost never can keep my uh, mouth shut is when somebody says, the man upstairs. Yeah. That just drives me to the moon. How degrading. How, how much taking the presence of His holiness and making it nothing but like us. Oh, he's a holy God. He, he, he's miraculous. He, he, he is glorious. And that is the reality of the person of Christ. And, and John the Apostle, he knew it, and he saw it, and he, he fell down. He was so overwhelmed by the person of Christ. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, <laughs> I am the first and the last. Isn't it amazing when he comes by sometimes and reminds you who he is? When you're fretting, when you think things are not going to work out this time, when, when you're thinking, hey, I, I don't know what's going to be next. And uh, he comes by and says, peace. Yeah, yeah. You, do you remember? And, and if you follow the first time that they were crossing, uh, Gennesaret, all there is is waves. Now later on, he's going to deal with uh, wind and rain waves. And they called him out and said, Lord, save us, lest we perish. And he watched up, he walked over there and said, peace be still. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a glorious, glorious, wonderful, in all control person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the Christ of the Bible. It's not the long-haired hippie Jesus. It's not the Catholic Jesus on the cross. It's not the baby Jesus in the manger. It is the man sitting, the God sitting at the right hand of Jehovah. That is Jesus Christ. And we should give him great glory in honor in that. Now I'm going to read two more verses. Got a little nervous. Colossians chapter 3. I thought Brother Junior was going to read my verse, and all I ever, after 30 years, all I know then is that, well, they need to hear it again. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3 in the first verse. <coughs> the Bible says, uh, And if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Now I made allusion to this already, but but don't uh, don't I want you to understand the working agent in this dispensation of the church is the Holy Ghost. And he has so been long minimized among Baptist people that we're almost afraid to say his name. Uh, that's a reality. That, that's one third of the Godhead. And, and if we don't have Holy Ghost conviction, we don't have nothing. If we don't have the Holy Ghost say, that is him. <laughs> Remember John the Baptist? When he walked on the scene, he says, that's him. And the next day he came back again and said, hey, that, that's him. That's the Holy Ghost job. In the modern church age, he, he, he will single it out. All of us who live in the South and have heard of Christ since before we can remember. In that day, in the day of your salvation, the Holy Ghost will say, that's him. And that, that, that is redemption. Listen, it's not saying a prayer. It's not asking him into your heart. I tell you what, you better have to be careful what you ask him in your heart. <laughs> right? And, and, and so we see that uh, Christ is at the right hand of God, even now, making, making intercession on our behalf. Romans chapter 8, and we're going to be done. The church at Rome defected. They became obsessed with the world. Sound familiar? They reduced God. Remember, we're talking about the person of Christ and what he is and who he is. The Bible says in Romans 1, 
that they reduce God to nothing more than an animal. That's sad, isn't it? And so we see to that church, we hear this, Romans 8 and verse 34. The Bible says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that he is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who maketh intercession for us. See, we don't need a Catholic priest to make intercession, do we? We have, uh, we have the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what? We're going to mess up. Not maybe, sh assuredly, you're going to mess up. Even right now, <laughs> Lord Jesus Christ, Larry is making a mess out of that. And he goes to the Father and says, well, Lord Jesus, I died for him. He's kind of smart. He's kind of not that smart. Bless it anyway. That, that's, that, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our intercessor. Can, can you get a hold of that this morning? He is intervening on my behalf even as I speak. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. We need nothing. We need nothing else. So what is your opinion of Christ? You think he's begging you? <laughs> Let me say this. The Christ I understand don't beg for nothing. Amen. Right. He's king. <laughs> Trust him with all that you have. If you've never been saved, all I can do is point you to Christ. He is the answer to your misery. He is the answer to your pain. He is the answer to your emptiness. He's the answer. 